<laughs> All right, guys, let's pray. We'll get into it this morning. Um, God, we just want to open up our hearts and our minds to you and to your truth. Lord, your word is such a gift. And um, we see it as being authoritative, as having something to say about our lives, Lord. And as we look at it today and we look at the things that you're doing, look at the things that other people are saying about you in John, Lord, I just want to ask that that our hearts might be receptive, Lord. I always think about that parable of, of the sower and the seeds and the different types of soil, Lord. I want to pray that you might break up my heart to be the soil that's ready to receive the seed rather than any other type of soil, Lord, that we might produce fruit for you. We pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Cool. Hey, I hope you guys are doing good. I hope, hope life is going well. You guys had a little time off Sunday, Monday, back in class today. I see that uh, Pastor Dane's been in here, one of my favorite Bible teachers in the world. Guy is absolutely phenomenal, so I'm really glad that he's, um, I mean, I knew he was coming in to teach you guys, but I'm glad that you're getting teaching from him. Hey, um, we had some questions from last week. I'll try to go back to the questions every time. We were talking about baptism, and the question was stated, um, are there two different types of baptism? Is there a baptism of repentance, and then a baptism of the Holy Spirit, or a, a water baptism. How does that kind of go together? Um, in my looking over it, you know, there was some mentions of different baptism, but I didn't find anything conclusive or biblical in a good um, argument to kind of tell me that there's more than one baptism. I actually found a, another verse that we'll get to in just a second. Um, but I do think baptism has changed its significance as the timeline paid, played out. And uh, a major part of today's discussion in the book of John is going to be about the covenant of God. We saw the covenant of God get played out with humanity in a bunch of different ways, and it's a really beautiful thing to study. And the covenant morphed, right? The covenant with Adam and Eve changed once humans sinned, right? The covenant continued on, and then, and then we have a covenant with Noah, with the sign of the rainbow. We have the covenant with Abraham. We have the covenant with Jacob, who kind of follows with the Abrahamic covenant. We have the covenant with Moses. And then we have the new covenant in Jesus. And it's all one <laughs> But it changed and progressed through time as it goes. And I believe that this is similar to baptism, even though there was baptism before um, Jesus. I believe that the baptism morphed a little bit into having some of that Holy Spirit stuff going on. Ephesians 4, 4 to 6 um, is a really good verse that talks about this. And I want to talk about what is this verse doing and how can we read it well? It says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, this passage is talking about unity. And in Ephesians, as the gospel is going out to the Gentiles and as Christianity is, is taking on different faces, same truth, same Holy Spirit, but different contexts. This is a call to a unity in it. Um, and you can see there's only one God. There's only one faith. There's only one baptism, one God and Father of us all. And it's this drawing together of things in, in keeping it the same across the board, regardless of context. Now, I do think that this verse speaks a little bit to not having multiple baptisms. I think that there's a shared unity globally um, that talks about baptism and that this verse kind of speaks to that. But at the same time, I'm not going to say that this absolutely, because the driving force of this verse is unity, we have to not look at it and be like, oh, there's only one baptism, so... Could the baptism have been different before Jesus' day? You see what I'm saying here? Guess what I'm trying to say is the Bible is not um, a textbook that is only spitting facts. The Bible is literature that is driving to a point. 
And the point that he's driving to here is let's unite on one thing, one father, and not have, I guess, get caught up in all of the, um, all the discrepancies of where it might play out in different contexts. Cool? Cool. All right. Any questions about baptism that we want to continue going on over that? Otherwise, we can talk after class if you want to continue on that. Hey, this morning we're not going to do a pop quiz. We're not going to do it every single week. Um, so we're going to keep moving on here. Um, I'm going to get you guys into groups of six again, or six groups of four, excuse me. Six groups of four. We'll go similar, one in this corner, two in the middle, three in the back, four over here, five over there, six over there. And uh, I want you guys to read through kind of a large chunk of scripture today. We're going to go, it says 34, but it's really 35. John 1, 35, you're going to read all the way through the wedding of Cana in, uh, in 2, chapter 12. You're going to see some calling of the first disciples. You're going to see what the disciples are talking about, how they're identifying Jesus. I find it really, really interesting. Um, after we read it, you know, everyone reads a little chunk. After we read it, please share something in the text that was highlighted to you, something that might have jumped off the page, something that stuck out to you in the midst of reading it, and then uh, we will get together and have our discussion on that. But as always, when we read scripture in here, I want to pray and just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us the truth, um, not just in a general revelation, which is very important, but also in a specific revelation for our lives and for the things that we're going through today. So let me say a word of prayer for that, and then uh, I'll break you guys up into groups, all right? God, you're good, and, and we love you. Lord, I just want to ask that you might please speak to us through this passage, Lord. Even though it's, you know, a lot of different characters moving around saying things, Lord, would the truths of your scripture, that your Holy Spirit was present in writing it, would that Holy Spirit interpret and bring us to your truth? We pray this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Cool. Hey, I'm just going to have you guys actually just read right on your table group. Whoever you're sitting at the table with, that's going to be your group. Let's get to it and read it this morning. I'm going to read with you guys. I'm going to be a part of your group. But you guys read it. I'm just hanging out. Philip called you 
when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the man of God, on the Son of God, man. Yeah, they didn't name her, did they? No, they didn't. And also the way Jesus just responded to says woman. Mm-hmm. That's a little aggressive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you think it's how the voice was? Oh, we're gonna get into it a little bit. <laughs> That's one of the talking points. I liked in this just stuck out to me just when reading it with you guys. Um, In verse 38, the disciples start by calling him rabbi, which means teacher. Then in 41, just a few hours later, they said, we found the Messiah, which means Christ. So their label for him before spending time with him to just a few hours later is, is pretty wild. It's interesting, too, that it's both are in parentheses. To me, it shows that the structure is kind of begging that, that they want you to see. They're doing it in a similar way. I love this story. I think it's such an interesting one, the water to wine. Did you have something, Kobe? Did you share already?
good words. Yeah, I'm going to give you guys about one more minute, and then we're going to get going on our lecture. <clears throat> Yeah, but it is it is short, and we'll get to it. We'll get to it. It is short. It's a it's a strange way of addressing your own mother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Catholics love this verse. So they're like, look, Mary told Jesus what to do. <laughs> Catholics are big fans. <laughs> All righty, guys. Let's bring it back in. <clears throat> a uh, interesting chunk of scripture here. Um, hey, I've really been enjoying studying this alongside you guys. This isn't something that I uh, studied for and then just come in and wing it. Like, I put in some prep time on this, and I've enjoyed my prep time on it. And so to be able to talk about it with you guys is very good. Hey, um... Location, location, location. We've got four different mentions of different places in this section alone, right? We start off with the Jordan River by Jerusalem, which is where Jesus was with John the Baptist. Remember, we got Jerusalem down here. Probably nearest to the Jordan is somewhere out in the wilderness, right? John the Baptist, the voice of one in the wilderness, calling out, make straight the paths, okay? Then all of a sudden, we're going up to Galilee. Galilee is this region here. We have Judea, which is the southern tribes, Jerusalem. We have Samaria. We're going to get into that chapter 4 of John, some of the things going on here. We got Galilee. Galilee has Nazareth in it, which would have been Jesus' hometown. So Jesus is down here, yet they're headed up to Galilee, about an 80-mile walk. Okay? I don't know if you've ever walked 80 miles. I have never, <laughs> never in my entire life. One of the longest days of hiking I've ever done is about 20, okay? And that was really hard and not fun. Um, it's a hot area of the world. There's not the best water, not the best roads. It's kind of a wild thing that the Bible might make us think, boom, Jesus just teleports himself. But, you know, he's traveling. He's moving around. He's taking his time. He's doing things. We, we need to remember Jesus is a human being who is living in the time of technology being different, right? It's a, it's a long walk. And as we see Jesus move around, I want you to consider, like, the, the personhood of Jesus. He would have been tired. He would have been hungry. would have been dusty. probably had some body odor, okay, that these are things that he had to deal with. Now, we're up here in Galilee. We got Cana, where the wedding is. And then where we end up is Capernaum, which would be in the, the Sea of Galilee. Darren did a great job describing the difference of the seas up at family camp. This is where all the water flowed into. It didn't have anything coming out of, so it was dead and salt. This one had flowing into and out of. This is where a lot of the fishing would have taken place. Um, in different stories of Jesus. Now, why would John, you're going to notice in this section in particular, he drops a lot of names and he drops a lot of places. I believe what he's doing here is it's not just for us to connect it to real things and a real location, um, even just to be able to think about, wow, Jesus had to walk 80 miles and it's just like quickly mentioned in a verse, like no big deal, right? Also, it connects the first readers with understanding. It gives hooks into reality in order for people to connect what's going on with what they're talking about here. Real places, real things going on. Jesus does a really interesting thing in choosing disciples. Now, if we look at choosing disciples from our worldview today, and if some dude came in, complete stranger, and just said, follow me, you'd probably be a little confused as to what's going on. And if we think about it, 
these, these random people, you know, you had the disciples of John the Baptist, but then we're going to have other random people. Jesus only says two quick words. <laughs> and they drop their stuff and they go after Jesus. Now, while I don't want to take away from the faith of these men in doing it, we also need to understand the culture of the day, okay? In Israel, there was no separation of church and state. Everyone that was born in Israel was born into the synagogue, and the synagogue or the temple, the synagogues would be the the places of meeting if you didn't live close to the temple. The synagogue would have been really the place where all social activity would kind of focus in. There would be feasts. There would be, obviously, getting together for worship of God. There would be this, this Sabbath that was protected by both civil and religious law. And we were living in a nation that was very intertwined between religion and the rest of life, okay? In fact... The most entertaining thing that would have happened would, would be what was written in the prophets and in the law, where you would read about them and you would be always on the lookout for what God is going to do next. There's all these promises of prophecies that the Messiah is going to come. There's all these amazing prophets that have come before. And you're kind of hoping that God's going to do something <laughs> in your nation. So in this culture of religion... Jesus coming up would be an invitation to the front row of the most exciting thing that could be happening that day. It would be entertaining, yes. It would be even deeper than that because of your deep-hearted commitment to Yahweh and God the Father and the sacrifice that you do. And it's kind of like if the only stories you knew were these amazing stories of prophets you would maybe be a little more apt to drop everything to go watch firsthand <laughs> what's going on. We have to remember there was no Instagram reels. There was no telephones. There was no recording equipment. If you wanted to really know what happened, you were going to be there. <laughs> if you wanted to hear about it, then people who were there would be sharing their story and passing it out all around. So these guys... Yes, they have faith. Yes, they have interest in things that God, are do God is doing. But Jesus is magnetic in a, in a certain sense here as well. And I don't want to take apart anything from that. There's something special about Jesus. But also, this invitation to follow would have been something where they've been like, yeah, that is everything I want. My life fishing is getting kind of boring. <laughs> I'd rather be there for these events and just hear about the things that are going out. Now, follow means more than just follow the leader walking around with this person. Obviously, we know that when Jesus utters these two words to us, it means make me Lord and Savior. Make me the king of your life. Make me the one in which your actions and life is going to look like. And, um, man, what an opportunity to watch firsthand what Jesus said and did, it would have been an absolutely amazing thing. So the disciples were very lucky to do it, even as they stepped forward in faith. Okay. What is John doing here, especially in the end of chapter one? We've seen the prologue. We've seen what he's talking about and the different things that he's bringing up. But in these specific verses, and actually just as I was reading with this group up here, in verse 39, John is giving labels to Jesus and identifying him through all kinds of different voices, right? Do we remember what the, what the thesis of the book of John was? The thesis of the book of John? Anyone? That we believe? Yeah, specifically it's John 20, 30 to 31. Who can open that up and read that for us again? John 20, 30 to 31. Who can read that for us out of the Bible? Yeah, read it for us, please. It's nice and loud.
Beautiful. So John has a real reason for writing this book, right? He wants you to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that you can have life through him. So how he's going about, we saw the eyewitness account of John the Baptist, and we're going to have a bunch more names tied in with saying things about who Jesus is. Um, the first one, actually, we're, we're going to skip back a little bit. It's interesting that in verse 30. Nine. Wait, where was this? I'm sorry. In 38, that Andrew goes in with Jesus, and, and they call him rabbi. And there's a little parenthesis that says, which means teacher. But after a few hours <laughs> with Jesus, in verse 40, 41, Andrew is saying, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. In Interesting how it went from rabbi to messiah real quick when they're spending time with Jesus. Now, messiah is a, is a fancy term for the anointed one. It would be reflecting back to, think about, you know, little boy David getting anointed with the head or with oil on the head that would say that he is going to be king. This is Jesus, the king that is to come, the king that is to set up the eternal kingdom is what we're talking about when we say Messiah. Christ is the same thing, the anointed one. So that's Andrew. He's one of the disciples. He calls Jesus the Messiah, which means the Christ. And then we have Philip, another one of the disciples, who says to his buddy, hey, him of whom Moses and the law was talking about, and who the prophets wrote, this is the guy we found. Do you hear how John is identifying Jesus through different voices? And these would be people that are well known to the church already. Nathaniel, another one of the disciples, calls him Rabbi, Son of God, King of Israel. And then we have Jesus also identifying himself in this really interesting verse in 51. We're going to unpack this in a little bit. But Jesus says the angels of God will be ascending and descending on the Son of Man, which has some deep ties to Israeli history as well. But before we get to verse 51, let's talk about Nathan and the fig tree. Did anyone, when they were reading this, be like, what was Nathan doing under that fig tree? <laughs> right? There's, there's some mystery around it, but for some reason, Nathan was incredibly impressed by Jesus that, that Whatever was going on at the fig tree that Jesus thought that Nathan was an upstanding Israelite. So it, it seems that Jesus had this special knowledge of whatever was going on there. Now, the fig tree in, in the past had represented provision, and, and being in the shade of a tree might be something that was happening in, in spiritual prayer. It's probably too big of a stretch to say that that's exactly what was happening. I really believe that whatever was happening there was not spelled out because, well, a lot of the Bible isn't spelled out. <laughs> it's not the main point of why it's being shared is what was happening there. But it's also bringing about this air of mystery both around Jesus, around what he knew, what he didn't know. And whatever it was, Nathan was so impressed that he's going to go ahead and call Jesus God. Um, I, I love it when, and we've talked about this before in here, I love it when God is given space to be mysterious. I, I love churches that give God space to be mysterious and that don't try to explain everything by reason. Um, in reading this, you know, the mystery that surrounds Nathan and Jesus it almost feels like, well, that's, that's for them to know. That's not my business. And yet, so often, we will have the temptation of pastors or teachers to try to explain logically everything that's going on. I think it's really important to say, you know, I don't know what was happening under the tree. <laughs> but I do know the point of it was to be impressed by the things that Jesus was saying and doing. Now, this culminates in John chapter 1, verse 51, where Jesus says something 
that is mysterious. <laughs> and what he says that's mysterious would have deep ties into the context of the day. I'm going to read the verse. It says, and he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Well, the word that he uses here in the Greek is truly, truly. And the Greek word for this, does anyone want to take a shot at how to say that? It's a word you know. You say it at the end of a prayer. Amen. 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 And so Jesus is actually starting this little phrase off saying, amen, amen. Which us, we might be like, oh, okay. Right? But to him... It's, it's a word in the Greek that is translated into the English as truly, truly, or verily, verily. Some of your Bibles might have said that. Or in truth, in very truth. But what it deals with is this idea of certainty or steadfastness. The reason that we use it at the end of our prayers is because it was used that way in some of the Psalms. And um, the, way, the reason we use it is that we pray in certainty and in trust of God and in the steadfastness of who he is. So in essence, when we pray and we say amen, we're saying, God, we're certain of this, we have faith with this, and we are steadfast with you, trusting the things that you have to say. Now, Jesus is talking about angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man, and this would be a connection to something that happened in the book of Genesis. I think it was Genesis chapter 28, where Jacob, who is later named Israel, was having a sleep and, and dreaming and saw angels climbing up and down a ladder. And it was this idea that heaven was going to be connected with the nation of Israel. Jacob went on to have the 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel, and goes on to be the promised people. Jacob, of course, his grandfather was Abraham, and his father was Isaac. Jesus is intentionally tying into something that's going to happen to Jesus with this monumental moment in Israel's history. What he's saying is, there is a covenant, and there is a new covenant that is coming in, and you're going to see the ushering in of the new covenant. As, as foundational as this connection between God and the nation of Israel is, will be that foundational about the things that I am going to do. Kind of a beautiful thing um, that Jesus identifies with in himself. Cool? Does that make sense? It's kind of cool how he touches back on that, yeah? How he's thinking about those things. Well, chapter 2. Got through chapter 1. Congratulations. Give yourselves a mini round of applause. You've done it. Congratulations. Only 20 more chapters to go. This rate will be done in six years. Just kidding. We'll get it. Um, the first miracle that Jesus performs as far as a sign. Now, some people might argue that there was a miracle that happened at Jesus' baptism where the spirit comes out in the form of a dove or the father speaks. Some people might even say that the first miracle or sign might be Nathan, but, but this one would be one that's done out in public and out kind of out in the world. We need to remember the purpose of the signs. We need to remember the section of the book of John that we're in. We're in the books of the signs, right? The time of Jesus doing signs. What are the purpose of doing signs? Well, it's Jesus pointing to him being the Messiah in whom can bring life to all. Now, some of you guys had kind of said before coming in here, wow, this, um, this miracle isn't talked about a lot. It's kind of mysterious. I don't hear a lot of teachings on this one. I hear a lot of teachings about maybe the blind receiving sight because that's you know, has some spiritual imagery to it, too. We don't hear a lot about the water and the wine. Well, part of that is wine is alcohol. And however you're going to look at this story, you cannot get away from the fact 
that Jesus is at a wedding providing massive amounts of alcohol to a party that has already used all of their alcohol. <laughs> okay? To get away from that fact would do damage to the text and would be reading a morality into it that it is not conveying. Okay? Now, historically, wine at this time would be much more diluted than the wine that we have today. The process of doing wine has changed quite a bit, and there's much more alcohol in the wine that there is now. But at the same time, in the New Testament, we hear, do not get drunk with wine, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. Can you get drunk off of this wine? Absolutely. Was this wine that had alcohol in it? Absolutely. Was Jesus able to do this? Well, he did it. And people aren't always comfortable with that. I'm going to give you a reason why we should be comfortable with it. Wine has always been about blessing, about having these things in which you're not just struggling to get from day to day, but if you have the time to pick grapes, to make it into wine, that there is blessing. When you have lots of wine, you're going to be fine. <laughs> there are things in front of you. Oftentimes, wine was even safer to drink than just the water that you would find. And in the Old Testament, we see often this idea that wine is, is this blessing of God in providing and providing more than he would. We find out here also in John chapter 2 that the wine that Jesus does is not just watered down stuff, but the guy who tastes it goes, wow, this is the best wine that we've had at the whole party. <laughs> I'm willing to bet it's probably the best wine the guy ever tasted in his whole life. And the wine that Jesus changes not only is the best, but it says that there was six casks that would have been between 20 and 30 gallons. So on a, on a safe estimation, we got 120 to 180 gallons of wine. Okay? That is a lot. A lot of wine in the abundance that Jesus has brought. Now, I'm going to get to this one in just a second. The fact that the wine came from a certain type of jar is fascinating. It says that the jars that were there, well, what does it say? What were they there for? Purification. purification. The Jewish rites of purification is what these huge jars were there for. And Jesus takes an Old Testament law that's written for purification and turns it into massive amounts of wine. Man, I could only imagine if this happened in a very, very strict Baptist church where you had this special water, right, that got turned into wine for a party. People would be tripping out on that. Church lit. Imagine, yeah. <laughs> imagine if the holy water at the Catholic church all of a sudden is being drank by this party that has already been going that they used up all their stuff already Jesus here is doing something he says hey I am bringing a new covenant the fact that the old covenant was the water yes it was good it was beautiful the law needed to be fulfilled the law has not passed away but it's fulfilled through Jesus the fact that he goes to these purification things and makes them into wine to continue the party I think goes with a very similar mindset of when the woman breaks the expensive perfume and lavishly pours it out on Jesus before he goes to the cross. He says, hey, the poor you'll always have with you. Me, you're not always going to have. Jesus' coming was a change, and it was a celebrated change. It was a beautiful thing, and this is showing celebration. Now, if we take wedding, right, the bride and the groom coming together, becoming one, there's a lot of echoes of that in Scripture about Jesus being the bridegroom, his church being the bride, coming together as one in the celebration that that brings. Now, by no means am I saying, and the Bible is not saying, wine is okay to get drunk off of. By no means does this say Jesus 
was a party animal. They got drunk all the time, so that's okay for me. We know that to not be true. But what I am saying is what he did here would have been, and it would shock a lot of our conservative churches today. But it's because of what he's doing with it, the things that he's saying. Now, there's an interesting conversation that goes on here between the mother of Jesus. Notice that she's not named Mary here, nor is she in the book of John. One of the guys I studied said maybe it's because they don't want to confuse her with the other Mary who would come into play here in the book of John. But the fact that she comes to Jesus in the early time of his life and says, hey, I want you to fix this. I wonder how she knew (laughs) that he might be able to do something here. I wonder if Jesus had done some weird stuff around the house (laughs) that could only be explained by something. Interesting, Jesus' response to her, woman, not mother, not something else. And while it might have been courteous, it was definitely short. It says, it's not my time. And yet... She goes, do whatever he says, not even listening to Jesus. And it seems like Jesus is listening to his mom. Now, I think what this is showing is some sort of obey your parents and honor them. I think also what this is showing is that that Jesus had to figure out what it was like to be a son (laughs) with someone that may not have been perfect. Now, the Catholic Church will love this story because they're like, see, Mary told Jesus what to do. (laughs) But I I wouldn't put it that way. I would put it in the way of Jesus understood the situation, and in it, even though he didn't necessarily want to, he followed that authority in his life of doing it. One thing I know about Jesus is that he is really, really great. One thing I know about um, working with non-Christians is that they often think that the Christian faith is going to be boring or lame, that they're not going to be able to do the things that they want to do. So far, what I see Jesus doing is looks really fun, (laughs) looks really entertaining, looks full of life. And while there, there are definitely aspects of things that we need to give up in order to follow the Lord, You will never give up something that will make your life better in the long run. The only things that we give up are empty promises. The only things that we choose to leave behind us are not actually good for us. Jesus has a beautiful life that's set out in front of us, and it is full of life. It's full of celebration. You look at You look at the Jewish faith, it just has festival after festival after feast after feast of spending time with family, of taking time off work, of hanging out and relaxing and enjoying life. And um, Jesus' life, while, while it is definitely hard, and while Jesus was known to be homeless and to teach and to work very, very hard where he was exhausted, it also says that that people about Jesus would call him a, uh, a glutton and a drunkard because of all the parties he was at. He probably had a good time at the parties <laughs> and yet was one of those guys that we emulate with. A, just take comfort, I guess, in the fact that Jesus lived a really, really full life really beautiful life and that there's a lot of things that we find interesting that are definitely within Jesus and his life that that maybe some super strict conservative churches don't need to have the walls up for cool cool um we got a few minutes questions thoughts concerns on this passage yes um Good question. I would love to talk with you afterwards, maybe. Kind of seems like a um, something you're thinking about with your life. Is that true? Um, yeah. I mean, we saw the disciples do that. 
when they had the opportunity that's before them. Um, but at the same time, the Lord will direct us and move us each specifically, you know. He may have called you to do that. He may have called one of your friends back at home to not do that. Where, in fact, if they went to Bible school, it would be disobedient to God. Um, there's not a necessarily a broad brushstroke there rule that we can always hang our hat on. Yeah. Um, so while we were reading uh, verse 39, it, it says something about like the timing. Sorry. <laughs> well, so that's the thing. Um, come, and, come and you'll see, he replied. So they went and saw where he was staying. They say within that day, and then give the time. There says four in the afternoon. Mine says ten in the morning. Is there significance to that? Is there a reason it's like that? Um, there's arguing among scholars if the Jewish day starts at sunrise or if it starts at midnight. So that's where you get the discrepancy there. Um, I believe that the Jewish day starts at, um, at sunrise. Because that would make more sense with the passage, because it was late, it says. Because um, they stayed with him, for it was about the 10th hour. To me, it would make more sense. It's like 4 p.m., the sun's starting to go down in a little bit, so they stayed with him. So, But it's interesting that the translation, you know, mine says the 10th hour. It's interesting that those translations translate it into a time on the clock. Yeah. So uh, I'm just curious about some like the positioning of where Jesus is. And you know in verse 51, so it talks about how, you know, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Right? And then uh, right, I looked in Genesis and it talked, it said that the Lord stood above the ladder. So I don't know. I, I'm just trying to like I'm trying to imagine like what it looks like. Well, what's interesting, too, is there's no mention of ladder here in this one. Um, where is God? God's in heaven and on earth. <laughs> I, I, think, I think the bigger the bigger question that's being nodded to here is that the thing that's happened with Jacob is now going to take on meaning through me. I think that's the bigger um, question. Rather than saying, like, oh, why isn't there a ladder here? Why, you know, I think that the biggest thing to take away is, is that one thing. And um, as far as where is God, we, we know he's both, right? Um, but I don't, I don't know if he's... I wouldn't say he's giving a doctrine of the Trinity here in this comment. Yeah. And, you know, does this happen literally or does this happen figuratively? Good question. There's a case to be made that the angels came and cared for Jesus after the temptation in the desert. Um, obviously, we know about the transfiguration. But. Yes. The new covenant is the wine being made from the water in the purification jars. And then what we see the wine become at the Lord's Supper when he says, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. It's a good question. Cool. Well, hey, it's, an, it's 1052. Um, we've put in some good work here this morning. If you have anything else, please come talk with me up here. Otherwise... I'm going to be back with you guys on Thursday morning again. So we'll be back on, pick it up in the next section, all right? Let me say a word of prayer, and then I'll dismiss you guys. Lord, thank you for your truth. Thank you for this new covenant. Thank you for the revelation that you gave to the disciples of calling you who you are. 
Lord, would these words and ideas and thoughts, would they sink deep into our lives? In your name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, you guys are excused.